Hey everybody, Party Moses here again. This is going to be the third battle tutorial that I'm going to do for my sort of School of the Soldier tutorial series about Grand Tactician the Civil War. Uh, in this battle, we're going to cover how to use entrenchments and how to uh, engage in sort of what happens in multi-day battles, um, both kind of uh, in the battle map and on the campaign map afterward as well. So we're going to load in here. I'm going to set some things up and I'll see you in a moment. Before we jump in, uh, I just want to point out a couple of things, uh, more, more details you can get about the battle map right when you start in. So obviously we have our deployment zone, we have you know the, the map itself, we can see where the enemy's coming in. They probably are going to be somewhere around Winchester, maybe even along these same ridges that we fought over in the last tutorial video. Uh, we'll see. Um, but I want to point out a couple of things. So the disposition of your forces in a lot of ways depends on what time of day it is and where the objectives are, that kind of thing, right? So if you look down here in the bottom right, you have a clock, and that'll tell you in military time what time it is. So it's 5.13 p.m., right at the start of the battle. So we have, um, it's about August, September, I think, in this campaign, uh, September 11th uh, in this campaign, 1861, which means sunset is probably going to be... Um, Sometimes it actually says when the sunset is, or I, I thought it did at some point. I guess not. Um, but sunset will probably be within three or four hours. So I expect before about 9 p.m. that we're going to get a cessation of combat and we're going to start sort of re redeploying and getting our men resupplied. I uh, just want to point that out before we get started. So I'm going to go ahead and press play and we'll see about enemy disposition and finding them and getting everything else sorted. See you in, in a bit. So as I'm setting up here, I just want to point out that this uh, is pretty common. And unfortunately, there's not really much you can do about it except try to stagger your arms. So let me, let me point out more specifically. So when you order several different divisions to march using the same roads, the divisions clump up with each other. They sort of wrestle for primacy of place and they, they don't have a neatly sort of staggered ability to march down the same road. And so what happens is one unit, say the 7th Brigade here, marches through another unit, say the 3rd Brigade here, and the 3rd Brigade becomes fragmented and their cohesion suffered. So this, actually, this affects their morale uh, and it affects various other things. But here we go at the end of day anyway. So all I've really done is I've... I've spotted the enemy. I used my skirmishers, like I showed in the last video. Uh, scouted the enemy, found their location, and I started marching my divisions over to a position around here so that they can set up kind of along the flank. This isn't necessarily a frontal charge or anything like that, but it's not like I'm not trying to circumvent their flank or anything like that. Um, I just want to kind of set up over this way. So along the way, we've hit the end of the day. And the end of the day basically means that there's no more fighting. Each side would kind of assemble into their camps. They would set out their pickets or their vedettes, and they would they would hunker down for, for the night. In this game, at the moment, there is really no ability to, or as far as I understand, interest in adding in sort of like night fighting or skirmishing. But there are a couple of things that you should know going into a multi-day battle. Because uh, if we look right now, Neither side has taken any casualties whatsoever, but as soon as we start the next day, you'll see that both sides have taken a few casualties, and there's a reason for that I'll point out in just a moment. But the most important thing is, at the end of the day, everything closes. We have hours now to get all of our men assembled and in formation for the next day's fighting. So what's going to happen is, as soon as I hit the end of day, it's going to bring up another sort of deployment screen, and we're going to have a different deployment zone that we can muster all of our troops in. So I'll show you that in just a second. We also get resupplied. Now, because we haven't actually done any fighting, the resupply doesn't really matter all that much. 
uh, at all, but it does kind of help to, you know, bring in some more, some more stuff, right? But we had 100% and we didn't need any more, but we got more provisions, which is pretty good. So anyway, we'll continue this. We have, again, a pretty small deployment zone, but that's okay. All of where I wanted to put my men are within the zone here. So I'm going to continue doing that. So I'm going to take uh, my first division here under Cadwallader, and I'm going to assemble it over here like I wanted to. In fact, I'm going to move it forward a little bit more. Um, I want them to be about here. I'd like my artillery uh, to be able to open up if they can. And what I was talking about earlier, so Butterfield here is part of the 3rd Division. They were the first unit that I ordered to assemble over here. And I ordered them to assemble, and they started marching, but then I ordered Cadwallader's 1st Division, and I ordered Kime's 2nd Division to march to similar locations, and that's how they got all snaggled up on the road. And it's important to keep in mind that that will happen. And if possible, you want to try to send your men around either cross lots or on different roads. And that's, to be fair, to be perfectly clear, it's a pain in the ass. It's it's something that I wish was like assisted a bit more by the AI in the game, but it just isn't. And you end up getting these clumps along these roads of men kind of jostling together and everything. And it's a fairly realistic element to have to manage. I just find it a little bit annoying because there's really no workaround and the way that they've designed the maps can be a little bit frustrating to to navigate around uh in any case you can stagger your orders a little bit it takes some time and it, it takes some micromanagement but it, it's possible to be done and again it is a realistic stress on moving lots of men around uh, you know a few square miles of battlefield so i i'm not i don't i don't hate it by any means I just sort of wish there was a little bit more to deal with it. But I'm going to finish my initial deployments here, and I will come back as soon as I start the action. So one last kind of annoying thing. So Patterson here, he is the Corps Commander. I want him to be over here. And if I were to normally, in a deployment, if I click on Patterson, hold down Alt, and right-click, he would just snap to the position over here. But for some reason, on the deployment phase of a second day of battle, he won't teleport automatically. So you could just tell him he has to go there, and you'll have to watch his little headquarters department march across the freaking battlefield. And I don't really know how this has been overlooked, but it's very annoying. Um, so anyway, let's press start. Let's make sure that Patterson is double timing. And right now we've just got an artillery bombardment opening up. And that's fine. I've got some rifled pieces. Or no, I don't. I have just six pounders. So never mind. Um, I'm going to set them both to counter battery fire at the moment. And we're going to let them go. And again, since this, this uh, tutorial mostly is about kind of how to use multi-day battles, I'm not going to be too aggressive here. But I do want to show a little bit about how things change as the battlefield itself changes. Um, in the course of of a battle like this, of a multi-day battle. So we're now in day two of the Battle of Harper's Ferry. I'm going to let it go to day three before I try to do anything really decisive. So I'm going to increase the speed here. I'm probably going to increase the speed in my editing program. So you're going to get to see a whole lot happen in a really short amount of time. Almost forgot, while that bombardment is going on, we look up here again, and we see that we've taken 266 casualties, almost 1% of our entire army. Uh, the enemy have taken similar amount of casualties, and none have been inflicted by my artillery so far. This is, if we look closer, so we can look at 3rd Division, and uh, the 3rd Division has this info panel down here, so we can look at losses, right? And our losses are 139. Now, these guys have not ever been under fire. So we can click in, we can look at, let's say Butterfield. Well, Butterfield has 18 losses. We can look at these. Um, and we can, we can sort of figure out exactly where they came from. So if we go into our HQ reports and we look at the third division and we look at the strength report, 
we can see how many men were missing, how many men are not present on the field. So the number of sick men are not on the field. They don't actually make up any part of the total strength of this regiment as it is on the field. They, they're, dis, they're, they're subtracted before the battle starts. So that's something that's just going to happen before every single battle. But what we want to look at over here is missing. So the number of missing casualties is a way that the game abstracts skirmishing at night, men getting lost in the darkness, men wandering away from camp, or men straight up deserting in the middle of in the middle of the night and so this is a way that it adds a, another cost a sort of a secondary cost to the to the this sort of multi-day battle type thing because of course historically at night it didn't mean everybody went to sleep it just meant that skirmishers and scouts and all sorts of other sort of clandestine clandestine nighttime activity went by both sides had pickets out. Both sides are sort of trying to find camp places in the dark. They're trying to do some maneuvering around in the dark to prepare for the next day. People get lost. People get hurt. People wander away. People desert. Uh, and, and of course, you know, nighttime patrols and vedettes and everything might actually fight and capture uh, men of the other side during the night. So I think it's kind of a neat thing that the game abstracts. And it can be really frustrating if you don't actually know what's going on. So if you look at this and say, like, why why have I lost 250 men? It's just nighttime. They just went to sleep. Well, no, they didn't just go to sleep. They're actually, you know, they're, they're fighting uh, and continuing to do... They're continuing to do combat type stuff, continuing to prepare and continuing to camp and fight and patrol and march and post pickets and everything all throughout the night. So it's not just passive, right? The nighttime stuff is a really important part of combat in this era. So that's all that's going on. That's all I wanted to point out. And I'm going to get back to rip roaring through the time here. So while we wait, I actually want to do a, a bit of a live experiment here. So I'm going to move this brigade back here, and I'm going to move this brigade over here, right next to it. And I'm going to again increase the speed. I want to just let them go, and I'll I'll tell you a little bit about why, uh, what I'm what I'm up to in a moment here. But for now, I want to watch. Look, we've inflicted five casualties on these guns with counter battery fire. We've probably hit some of these infantry as well. Maybe even some of the cavalry. Yeah. Cavalry's taking 30 casualties. I don't know if that's from us or if it's from, uh, from you know, desertion and everything in the night. But, okay. So the reason that I have moved both of these brigades next to each other and the reason I'm moving their, their division commanders next to each other is because I want to conduct a little bit of an experiment. So these two brigades are both... Uh, they have different levels of training. So my 4th Brigade here under McLarenand is regular. So he's pretty well trained. And Nagley's men are untrained. So regular is like the third tick above. It goes untrained, poor, regular. And I think above regular is excellent. I'd have to double check on that. But what I want them to do, I'm going to actually order them both. I'm going to give them both basic, uh, basic commands. I'm going to shift them around just a little bit before I go. I'm going to get these guys a little bit closer. Uh, same sort of thing, right? So I'm going to pause it. I'm going to give both of them commands to counter march, to turn around and march backward toward the Department of Pennsylvania, toward Patterson himself right here. They're going to move about 100 yards. They're going to move about the same distance both times. And I just want to look at how both of them move and how quickly both of them are able to assemble. Uh, and I'm going to march them around a little bit more, and we're going to do, we're going to look and see if there's any difference between how quickly the regular trained men march and deploy versus how quickly the untrained men march and deploy. Both of them are well rested. Both of them are fully intact. Both of them have uh, are supported and in range of their commander. So the only factor that should make a difference here is their level of training. So all I'm going to do, I'm going to give them both the same orders. I'm going to have them just march. Here, so this means they're going to have to wheel to the rear, and march forward. This is this is probably about a hundred yards. So I'm going to give them that order. It's just going to be a straight up order, not a retreat. I'm going to tell them to go, 
and I'm going to tell these guys to do basically the same thing. And as soon as I press play, they should begin to execute those orders. Both orders are still processing. And even Cadwallader's training is different, although this might actually just be in reference to his entire division rather than him personally. So I don't really know. But in the meanwhile, my artillery barrage continues. And yeah, so they're both uh, wheeling around the center. So that they're kind of clumping together, turning around. So like the file closers and the front marchers and everything are uh, in front as they should be. And they're going to uh, pretty soon start marching. And actually, interestingly, the untrained guys started moving first. I honestly, I I know that the graphics aren't the best, and on my PC they're not. They're certainly not. But I I really love the look of the the 3D models. I think they look pretty sharp. Yeah. So my untrained men actually perform perfectly well, perfectly adequately. Um. So I'm gonna do another thing. I'm gonna pause it here. I'm gonna give them both orders to change into square formation, and I'm gonna see how long that takes. Honestly, not really much of a noticeable difference. I expected this to be much more in favor of the regularly trained men. That's interesting. All right, so let's deploy them back into single line. And now what I want, I want to march them uh, a distance where they're going to have to form into a column of march, a column of fours, and then redeploy uh, into this line. And I want to see if, again, there's any difference gets made on either of those. And in this case, it looks like the regulars maybe had the advantage that time. Yeah, okay, so pause one more time. This is gonna be the last little experiment I do. I just wanna make sure that they're marching a distance that it's gonna force them to march in column and then redeploy in line. So I'm gonna do, this is gonna be about 500 yards or so, right to the limits of their division commander's combat radius or uh, command radius. There you go, issue orders. I'm going to put it on five times speed as well. This Maybe this is the difference too, because so uh, Cadwallader actually lagged a little bit behind in giving the order. The order actually reached the untrained guys first, but the untrained guys looked to be a little bit ahead of or the regular men look to be a little bit ahead of the untrained men. And they are deploying a little bit faster. And remember they, oh, no, here they go. Sort of messing about. <laughs> yeah, I, I wondered if this, if this behavior here, this sort of like, as soon as they, they deploy from column into the line, they're in the line, but then they wheel the line 360 degrees and then march forward and redeploy back into a line. So that's, I, I thought that might've been something that was just sort of a visual indicator of the level of training, but it looks like it isn't. It looks like both regularly trained and untrained men do the same thing. Um, but it does look like in that distance marching, the regulars actually have a fairly significant speed increase um, not only in the in the speed at which they actually march but their speed of of deployment into column uh, deployment into line and then that second deployment into line as they advance as well it seems to i mean it's it's only a few seconds but it, i think that's fairly significant i think that's pretty interesting so anyway i'm going to get these guys back into their divisions and i'm going to put their division commanders back where they uh, ought to go 
and we're just going to get back to it. But I wanted to conduct that little experiment. I wanted that to be in a tutorial because it was something I was wondering about myself. And, I, you know, it's a good opportunity as any to test it out. Might as well make it one more race, huh? I know he didn't belong back here, but that's where I'm going to make him go in any case. That was interesting. They deployed basically from fronting this way into a, a line, a column that way, and started marching quite quickly. Again, it's it's almost impossible to tell if that's a quirk of the game, if it's like just sort of a... like kind of clumsy uh, um, clumsy sort of organization of, of how they, they do this or if it's if it's actually like a feature of the training I'm, I, I can't really be sure in any case uh, I'm going to let them batter this uh, this piece of artillery here they've taken 20 casualties now that's something cavalry still at 30 infantry's at 15 so artillery is doing some work. And I, I actually, uh, since we have the whole day. Okay. So we're actually going through our ammunition pretty quickly. So we can look at the ammunition here. And artillery fire essentially three different types of ammunition in the 1860s. So they have um, round shot. They have spherical case or shell. Um, they're sort of interchangeable and somewhat different a little bit. And then they have canister shot. And I believe the way that they organize this here is leftmost, this is the round shot, the solid ball. The middle is their shell or case shot, the exploding shells. And then this side here is canister. I believe that's the order in which they're derived. Um, so obviously they've been firing a whole lot. Um, so both of them are low on exploding shell. And we can actually see the difference over here because earlier when we were watching the bombardment, there are a lot of these little puffs of white smoke, but now that they're firing just the round shot, you only see the dust kick up from when they're, they're, the cannonballs actually hit the ground, right? Um, so that's interesting. So we're running low on ammunition. So when it comes to the end of day two, ammunition is going to be a big deal. We're going to want to make sure that we get as much ammo up to our... Uh, our cannons as possible because we want them to be useful in the entire battle, right? So in order to exacerbate my supply issues, I'm going to, of course, have them bombard this whole area. So it's not going to be super effective, one, because they're six pounders, and two, because they're basically limited at this point to firing only round shot, only solid shot. Um, but we'll see. But this is going to make them go through their, their ammunition really rapidly. It's also going to help kind of level these guys up, which is pretty cool. Um, and as they go, I'm going to just check on their HQ reports. I'm just going to see. Don't want the brigade. I want the division. My artillery battalion. Oh, that's the strength report. I want the combat report. Artillery battalion, uh, 24 total victories. That's not so bad. <laughs> For an entire day of firing, you know, that's quite, that's, that's something. But fourth battery here, 63. So it's okay. You know, they're not doing too bad. Um, and again, like I've said a few times before, you know, the, the artillery is actually much more of a, of a morale draining weapon rather than something that you should expect to, to inflict a whole lot of casualties on you. It also looks like none of my men are currently under fire by artillery, which is nice. No need to take any uh, extra casualties here. Looks like casualties are jumping up a little bit, and I've even inflicted some on the on the cavalry there too. So this would be, I, I doubt it'll happen, but it'd be pretty interesting if just my my two small batteries of six pounders did enough morale damage to the Confederates to force them to retreat before I get my day three. But we'll see. All right, again, I'm going to zoom out. I'm going to increase the speed on my video editor here, so we can just sort of watch this happen. We have knocked out one of their guns, which is pretty interesting. And 
the Confederates have actually dispatched an infantry, like infantry volunteers detached from Hill's command, uh, have come over here to man this other gun, this single gun, uh, which is a really neat feature of this game. I think that's really cool. So now it does actually show that uh, my men are being fired upon, so I'm going to order them to lay down. And my batteries just have to stay up. That is their lot in life. They are forced to kind of take this, uh, this artillery fire here because that's their job. Now, historically, the gunners in the Union Army, in the Federal Army, were stupendous. Uh, in a lot of the early kind of messes that was the, the like Peninsula Campaign and some of the early early Union campaigns, uh, it was really the artillery that always made the, the difference between disaster and and defeat. Otherwise, you know, in the Peninsula Campaign especially, it was the artillery and the engineers that actually came to basically save save the Union's bacon uh, more than once. Uh, especially when the uh, you know the Rebel infantry just were much better earlier on um and that that obviously got leveled out as the as the war progressed and i i certainly don't think that the cliche that the rebels were just sort of like superior soldiers throughout the duration of the war is anything but lost cause nonsense uh but it is true that right at the beginning of the war the uh, uh, you know the rebel infantry were pretty spectacular and it was really that the the union had such superb artillerists uh that really kind of made a difference there. And so Doubleday over here, um, having a good batting average, I guess. He's, uh, he's just about to gain himself a perk, which is pretty cool. It looks like we've actually knocked out that whole artillery battalion. So now we're just down to Hill's detachment here, the infantry volunteers manning this gun. So one thing that I think is kind of neat is that because they're so low on ammunition, the, they have automatically stopped bombarding and they're, they've reverted back to fire at will. So I think that's pretty cool. I've never noticed that before. So we should watch out for Doubleday's losses too. Um, he's taken quite a few casualties and he is... Uh, Maybe not doing so hot anymore. But the end, of, the end of the day draws near. And if he gets up to this sort of fifth part here, I will definitely start withdrawing him. Uh, but until then, he's going to do his duty, and he's going to stay there. And uh, he's going to batter this volunteer detachment into submission. This detachment is now down to zero guns, and some others still firing. And we have driven away that second, uh, that volunteer battery. So they're going to send out another detachment to man the guns. But I've knocked out, I've physically knocked out so many of them. Uh, yeah, they don't actually have any guns. I've, I've knocked out every single gun in this battery. I've destroyed every single gun in that battery. And so they, they can't actually man anything. They're just sending a detachment there to get shot at. Man, it's so aggravating to almost be there at the perk. Not quite. All right, so end of day. Um, we're going to get into day three, and we're just going to mop this up. Again, they, they have less than half of the men that we have. And so I'm just going to get my infantry deployed, and I'm going to mop this battle up a little bit. But I do want to see what effect the resupply has on my artillery. So we're looking at Double Day here. He has been resupplied. So now he's got nine spherical case or exploding shell, uh, or solid shot, rather. Nine solid shot, 13 spherical case or exploding shell, and 19 uh, canister shot. And similar over here to Colonel Morgan's battery, they are back up 
to having a, a fairly adequate supply. So I'm not going to bombard or anything like that. I'm going to leave them on fire at will, but I will be detaching them from their parent uh, divisions uh, as the infantry goes forward. So again, detach is down here in this commander tab. You can detach them there. And then I'm going to deploy my infantry divisions pretty aggressively up here on the edge of my deployment zone. Uh, and before I start, I'm just going to sort of explain my strategy here. So I'm going to do a fairly common tactic um, of, of advancing. I'm going to do what's called advancing in echelon. So what I'm going to do is have my second division advance first until they get into contact over here. Now they will be contending with this battery. So I am going to send skirmishers there first, but I'll reabsorb them as soon as I get along the line here. And the reason I'm doing this is mostly because I want them, I'm using my second division as a way to pull aggro from this whole army. I want all of them to be focused on this single division. And that does mean these guys are gonna take a lot of casualties, but them's the breaks. That's just how this works. And as soon as they start kind of get, drawing fire, I'm gonna start moving my first division to come here around the flank. And as soon as they engage, I'm going to advance my third division around the back and hopefully push them off the field. So the idea being, these guys are gonna get hammered. They're gonna take a lot of casualties, but they're going to fix the focus of the enemy on them. I'm going to use my first division up here to engage and start killing them along the ridge here. They're gonna probably scramble and redeploy and try to come over here. And then they're gonna get hit with my fresh third division that's coming around, which will be on their sort of reverted right. And if you do it well enough, if you sort of time it well enough, they will be, they'll, they'll sort of concentrate so much on this first division, they're gonna chew it up, but they'll be fine. And then they're gonna to have to force with this second fresh group and then this third fresh group as it comes in. So this is actually fairly typical of civil war strategy and civil war tactics, because it was a really effective way to assault entrenched positions by using, using essentially a kind of almost sacrificial fixing force as a way to keep the enemy in place and to keep their line in place so that you could actually work around to the flanks. So almost every time you read about people kind of marching madly toward you know prepared positions and just getting shot down in droves, the idea is that they're they are a fixing force. They have they are basically volunteered to be shot down so that they can let other parts of the army do the real killing work. And that's essentially what I'm going to try to do here. And it'll probably work. It's not that hard. But I just wanted to explain that because once we get started with this, I'm just going to kind of let the time roll. And here we go. So advance straight up. I don't want them to get clogged up in that creek. So I'm going to move them a bit here. I'm going to get them off that wall. Tell them to advance so that they fire on the way. And I'm going to tell these guys to deploy here. But I'm going to tell them to move at my signal. And the same thing with these guys. I'm going to actually have them move here, and then I'm going to wheel them to the right to slam into the rear. But I'm going to tell them also to move at the signal. So here we go. And you see the, the moving at the signal, um, not only... Oh, they've moved their whole line. <laughs> All right, so we'll stop. This is, uh, this is something that happens every now and again. So we'll, we'll have to redeploy a little bit. I'm going to have these guys lay down. I'm going to have these guys stop. So we'll get these guys redeployed this way. We'll get these guys over here. We'll get these guys over here. And I mean, I'm going to take artillery fire. It's It, it happens. It's not a big deal. Sometimes that'll happen, right? And this is one of the reasons I want to show all three of the, uh, of the days of this attack. Because this kind of thing is fairly frequent. Like this kind of thing happens all the time you have this like setup plan and you can explain it all and talk about the historical accuracy of it and everything like that and then the enemy will just they will have redeployed at night and there's nothing you can do about it so it's a bummer but you know it happens it's not a big deal i'm essentially going to do the same thing just with slightly different positions here and they don't have entrenchments i can actually take advantage of the entrenchments on my own all right i'm gonna have these guys just i'm gonna have them advance um Again, I don't want to necessarily get them caught on the terrain here, so I'm going to have them go there, tell them to advance. 
get these guys to come up here. And before I give that command, I'm actually going to take off. I talked about it a little before. Commander, I'm going to take use roads off because I don't actually want them to stick to the roads. I just want them to advance uh, across the field as much as possible. So again, we're going to tell them to move at the signal. Which I think is a really neat, and uh, it's it's a fairly under, as far as I can see from other YouTubers, it's a fairly underused uh, element of the game, which I, th I think it is, I think it's a pretty neat thing, uh, and I don't see a lot of other players use it. Okay, here we go. So obviously, just because these guys are a fixing force uh, doesn't mean I should be brain dead with how to use them. So as soon as these guys get in place, I'm going to actually have them stick along the walls and fire on this uh, cavalry if they're in range from there. But it, yeah, they're going to get a little bit messed up by the terrain. And again, it happens. It's not something you have to worry about all that much. I might actually move my third division back over this way. Messing up my perfect plans. Yeah, they're going to be out of range, so I'm going to have to... I'm going to move these guys up to engage here. I'm going to get them just past the wall. I don't... No, I'm not. Killed in action. Abner Doubleday. Killed in action. Interesting. He really struck out that time, huh? So I get, I suppose because uh, I will not be, I will no longer be seeing Abner Doubleday in this sort of campaign that I'm using. I guess I can, I can reveal that I have been making horrible baseball puns uh, the entire time. Who else is Morgan? Is my other artillery uh, commander. So you know what? They're taking a beating, so I'm actually going to withdraw both of my artillery, because they're not really adding much right now. And I'm going to advance my third division and start engaging here on the flanks and support my first division. Sub brigade, get in there. And I'm going to have them hoof it double time. If I have any infantry perks coming up yet, not quite. All right, let's get time advancing again. I'm gonna also get these skirmishers over here too. Oh, the enemy is retreating. Perfect. Again, this is a bit of a weird battle, but weird battles happen in this game all the time. Uh, and uh, we're gonna mop this up a little bit. Let's see how many casualties we can inflict. See if we can capture some prisoners as normal. Advance these guys pretty aggressively. In fact, I'm actually going to order these men to engage. I'm going to double time these men back behind because I want to charge and hopefully capture Toombs' brigade here. So I never really want to, personally, I never try to charge um, any enemy forces unless they're wavering. Uh, it's just too risky to roll the dice on infantry assaults that way, uh, unless you're fairly confident that you have a pretty big advantage uh, against them. So I'm going to wait until these guys start wavering. They've lost 850 men, so they should start wavering pretty soon, but they're also hammering John Abercrombie over here. So I want to be really careful in how I engage with them, and I don't want to be overconfident. So again, we can see that they, they have some cover that's providing a little bit of a morale bump, but they are being outflanked. And so that is a much more critical demoralization than, not, than, than having a little bit of cover. So as soon as McCook uh, gets engaged, there they go. 
I'm going to wait for him to deploy in line. And I'm going to have him charge. And as soon as he starts charging, I'm going to charge McLaren in here uh, into them as well. So lines deployed. They're in good order. I'm going to have him charge. I'm going to have McLaren in charge. And I'm also going to have Abercrombie charging as well. So if you try this stuff, don't worry necessarily if your men uh, fail, if they break when they charge, because it is really rolling the dice. It's something that's really risky. But generally, one of the sort of interesting things about the mechanics of the charge here is that the, the charge imparts a major but very short-term loss of morale. And so it's very common that if you have a unit that lost a charge like this, like they went forward and they were repulsed, um, you know, you'll lose the charge and you'll, you'll lose the tactical advantage you hope to have from making the charge, but you probably will, you'll probably get your, uh, your brigade or division or, or whatever it is that you charge back in fighting form pretty soon. Um, I've seen that happen quite often. So it's not something to be really all too worried about. Uh, necessarily um, unless they were already wavering and breaking and they were already in very very low morale then they're probably going to be break and be gone for good and of course we've already won the battle um, so you know um, and again I'm hoping that we can catch on camera here one of these brigades totally breaking and uh, we can we can see what happens when you capture one Again, ordering a charge. I am not going to order a charge with these guys just because their 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 disposition is poor, uh, and I don't really want to. I don't really want to risk it. But with these guys, good order. Uh, the only debuff they have is that they're attacking somebody in cover. Um, but this unit here is cut off, and I don't really want to order my oh i can get my division commander up a little closer i actually want to test something out too oh and look look at that we did we uh we whipped out whipped notice the misspelling uh they wiped out Colonel Hill's brigade, and we took 837 men captive. That's pretty great. And as we saw, my second brigade, they broke. Uh, and I'm going to pause it real quick to look at some of the debuffs that they have here. So current morale, obviously 0%. Uh, and they're massively debuffed by flanking fire. Uh, they're debuffed massively by having enemy cavalry very close to them, and massively debuffed by having uh, enemy charge them. So the overall change... Uh, is 281% by the combination of all that stuff, right? So every single time you do a charge, that kind of thing happens. But I wouldn't be surprised to see 2nd Brigade under Winkoop over here actually recover quite quickly. So I'm actually going to have the commander try to rally them. It's a thing that might happen. And in the meantime, let's take a look at these guys. So they're in a very similar spot, right? Like, almost everything else is the same. They've got... Uh, minus 1% enemy in cover, enemy cavalry close, minus 100% of their morale. Charged by enemy, minus 13%, and routed units nearby, uh, negative 3. So, between the two of them, basically having done the same thing, we've got Winkoop over here, minus 200 plus percent, and this guy only minus 75%. And similarly over here, um, they don't have any of those debuffs. And it might be because they're separated by the creek from the cavalry. Um, who knows? Uh, but this is just what I mean about the, the charge stuff being very temperamental. And they're already starting to recover, right? So it, I, I gained a 120% of, uh, of my fighting sp uh, my morale back from that short-lived charge. And it's mostly because, again, infantry don't like, don't like fighting enemy cavalry. Um, and a lot of times when you'll try to make charges like that, the, the morale effects are can be somewhat bewildering and extreme right and i think this guy broke again because there was another routed unit nearby yeah negative 53 percent for routed units nearby and that's actually because the fifth brigade broke and 
so that's another thing to pay attention to, right? Like nearby broken brigades, even if they're just broken skirmishers, uh, will make a really big difference to nearby units. And so you can sometimes cause or, or see chain routes happen because of one successful charge just rippling on down a line. So in any case, that's about it. I'm gonna wrap this up here. I'm gonna increase the speed. There's nothing really more I want to demonstrate in any of this. Um, I'm gonna have these guys stop. And uh, I'm gonna let uh, my guys cover. And uh, we're gonna see, we'll see you back in the, the re yeah, the screen here. So again, major victory, 5,100 casualties out of 10,000, about half of their men. And I took relatively light casualties there. Um, and I was trying to demonstrate quite a bit there too. So the one last thing I want to point out real quick is that because of the length of the battle, this was a three day battle that we just fought. So I've actually, I had to come out and immediately fight another battle here outside Washington, DC that only took two days. Uh, it started in the evening, uh, of the second day of this battle and ended on the morning of the third day of this battle. So this battle is still going on on the campaign map. So once you exit this battle, so we know what happens, right? But it sort of breaks us back in time. We come back to the campaign map at the same moment that this battle started on the battle map. And it will lock in your army until it ends, right? if that makes sense, right? So like, I can't actually do anything with the Department of Pennsylvania because right now they're actually involved in a battle. And in the meantime, while that battle was going on, I was attacked by the Confederate Army of the Potomac and I had to repel it with my army of Northeastern Virginia. Um, so that happened, I pushed them back, we came back here and my department of Pennsylvania is still locked in that same battle. So that's something to be aware of when you're playing a longer campaign is that those multi-day battles actually do have an effect here on the campaign map. It just kind of locks that army in for the same number of days the battle took. So as we advance time here, hopefully nothing else kind of extreme happens. We'll see that that ends, it clicks in, and we can start seeing the sort of pursuit and casualties as the uh, as the enemy armies are pushed back. So as I kind of speed up time a little bit, you'll see them both route. Uh, and as soon as they do, then we can go back and we can kind of look at our army once again. Um, so hopefully before anything else happens, I can get my army of Northeastern Virginia reorganized because I'm mostly just waiting on a bunch of new drafts to fill in my uh my manpower shortages so that's all but i will uh once again i'll talk to you next time and if you like what you're seeing here please give me a thank please subscribe if you like uh and spread the word thanks a lot